Our guest is Ambassador Thomas Pickering. He holds the rank of career ambassador and is former U.S. ambassador to six countries. He was also former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations and former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. Ambassador, so good to sit and talk with you. Thank you, Dennis. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my Lord, uh, uh, four decades in, uh, in, the, in the Foreign Service. Uh, when, when you look at the world today, what, what do you see? Big change. Some of it not for the good. Uh -huh. It's hard to be optimistic. On the other hand, I think over the long term, more people are involved in more things. Communication has changed and technology is changing. And so, in effect, what we are seeing, like it or not, is the growth of more popular influence in the way countries are governed and the way in which uh, the leadership is chosen. And this is very interesting. Now, it hasn't been all to our delight uh -huh. in the Arab world, as you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think the message is clear that people want their say and they believe they must have it. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a way, I think that represents real progress. I'm a believer in democracy. I'm a believer in popular participation. Uh, and we could talk about that. I think our electoral process has gone off the rails. Mm. There are interesting ideas out there. I think that we need to stop this gerrymandering that we go through in redistricting. I think it is fundamentally opposed to the democratic principles of this country that people's choice is, in effect, hedged in mm. uh, by choosing districts, which are always going to go one way. I don't believe in term limits. I believe that people need to go out and battle for their job, mm -hmm. and they need, obviously, to be connected with the public. But the notion that after a certain period of time, their seniority and their experience should be thrown out the window. Of course, yeah. I'm over 80, so <laughs> you understand why I say that. But I would be strongly in favor of having our electoral process like the Australians. I believe in compulsory election. Yes, yes. I don't mean that you don't have to vote. You've got to show up at the polls. Yep. But, you know, Norm Orenstein, who's a man I highly respect, Norm gave me the best view. He surprised me once, and he said, I believe in the Australian system. I always have because I was there mm -hmm. as a student, mm -hmm. and I thought it worked. But he said... Mandatory you, voting. Yeah, that you've got to come to the polls. Mm -hmm. But you know what he said? He said... Right now, the only people that American politicians can count on are the extremes to come to vote. So how do ah. they pitch themselves? And what policies and ideas do they adopt? The mm. most extreme. If, in fact, they knew that the great center was going to show up at the polls, I think, from his perspective, wow. and certainly from mine, we would see a shift in the American political orientation of the leaders, who are obviously going to be responsive to the people who vote. So I thought that was good. I also think that we need to have standards for registration that are tighter than what we've got. It belongs to the states, but the states ought to treat everybody equally. And I would have no objection now to having a voter's card that would entitle you to vote, mm -hmm. issued by the states, uh, I don't believe in, you know, national registration and all of that kind of thing. But I think, look, we got it now with Social Security numbers already. Sure. And the notion that we would have a card that would say, you're an American citizen, you're entitled to vote, uh, and if you're going to be absentee, you can use that in another jurisdiction if you have a good reason. Mm. But I think all of those things would begin to help us democratize the electoral process. Would you take it a step further sure. and penalize people if they didn't? Uh, in show Australia, up? they have a nominal hundred dollar fine. My mm -hmm. Australian friends say it rarely is imposed, uh -huh. but because it might be, more people show up, and so they have very high voter turnout. Mm. And it's helped them get used to this notion that they have an obligation. Now, the notion that be punished if they don't meet their national obligation, well, we would have to decide that. But I don't think it would be effective uh, without some penalty, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. I recall in Singapore, if you don't vote uh, and you're in line for housing, in, <laughs> you get, get down, to, the, line. down yeah. the list. You lose yeah. entitlements. Yeah. Yeah. But now you see, seem to suggest, in response to our, our opening little block here, that this idea of voting uh, and a, a kind of a democracy-style uh, election 
is opening up the world as to how world leaders are chosen, but we seem to be remiss here at home. I think that we've slid into bad habits in large measure because of the inordinately strong influence of a competitive electoral process and the fact that people haven't thought about it or that the parties have sort of said, let's divide it up. Where you're in mm -hmm. charge of a state, you get to gerrymander. Mm -hmm. Where we're in charge of a state, we get to gerrymander. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I think it's gone too far. I mean, the notion that people are there perpetually, that 80% of the jobs in the House of Representatives are sort of stuck, uh, that in effect... Uh, if you're there, you, you get elected, elected over and, and over. And, and you influence the party to make sure that every 10 years your district is, is fixed solidly for you as much as you can. Mm -hmm. I think all of those things are, uh, are wrong. I think we should have balanced districts as much as we can. They should be roughly the same size. They should be coterminous wherever possible. And I would do what Maine and I think Nebraska do is to choose some jurists who have not had partisan political life, mm -hmm. who are known as fair people, who are going to be objective, and say, you guys do the, the, the redistricting. Keep it out of the hands of the state legislatures. Ah. Let, let folks that we trust, and in our system, the judiciary has developed a lot of trust. It isn't perfect, mm -hmm. but uh, senior judges, particularly federal judges and senior state judges, generally are looked at as people who are fair and equitable and who would do a good job. They tried to pull a fast one in Virginia. <laughs> yeah. It didn't work. I, I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, we're going to take a little break. We're thrilled to have with us Ambassador Tom Pickering, uh, ambassador to, um, I think by my count, six different countries representing yeah, the, United the United Nations, Nations. Yeah. and the United mm -hmm. Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, he is just uh, looked upon, and we're talking about Russia, India, Israel, <laughs> uh, El Salvador, Nigeria, and Jordan. Uh, ambassador representing us in the United Nations, Under Secretary of State, career ambassador. It is a thrill to sit and talk with him about America's role in the world. We'll be back on the other side. This is America and the World. This is America is brought to you by the National Education Association the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsong Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. The U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. So where is our place in the world, America's place in the world, and what should uh, Americans know about our role? I believe firmly that we have the size, the strength, the economic power, and I think the devotion to principles in the main to accept and adopt the, the responsibility of a lead role. Mm -hmm. That does not mean a dictating role. Uh -huh. And it means finding answers through consultation, and through work with others to seek the best set of alternatives, not to make quick decisions that we have to do this or we have to do that and everybody has to fly up. And over the Cold War, we did that a lot with our allies. After the Cold War, we sort of let that slide. And we began to think that because we did well in the Cold War, we could do well alone, mm -hmm. leading out in front. And there was nobody else there competing with us. During the Cold War, we had to compete. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union was not, in my view, everybody's choice of best friend. Uh, some people slid in that direction. I uh -huh. think they were wrong. But we had to compete, which meant, in effect, that we had to work with other people. I think we need to get back to that model. Mm -hmm. And I believe, particularly with the larger countries of the world, the Chinas, the Russias, the mm -hmm. Indias, the European Union, Japan, Brazil. We need to have a bilateral relationship that is built on win-win, mutual interest, and we need to find that. Uh -huh. We don't have it with everybody the same way, 
but we do share with a lot of countries, including people who we thought were our enemies, a uh, common interest, for instance, in nuclear stability. Yes. A common interest in open trade. A common interest, if I could put it this way, in keeping the world's economy on an even keel and promoting growth. Mm -hmm. Those are important. And when you build that kind of a positive relationship with a country that you might otherwise have tensions and antagonisms and differences, mm -hmm. that begins to commit to make that common interest, that win-win work for you. If it does, it begins to get you thinking about how can I deal with this negative problem a little more cleverly, yes. a little more openly? Can't yeah. we talk about it? At least we can put it aside from being the centerpiece of our relationship. And in some countries, Russia, I noticed this in particular, President Putin, when he gets back to electoral politics, likes to run on an anti-American platform, mm -hmm. a nationalist platform. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we'll have to say to him, we can't have win-win and then spend the next three years beating the hell out of the United States in order to be able to be sure that those people who are demonstrating against you in the streets of Moscow mm -hmm. and other places are somehow going to be sublimated by a wave of enthusiastic nationalism of people who don't think about the future but think anti-Americanism is the way to go. Mm. Did we miss the boat when you look at Iraq and uh, Afghanistan of uh, knowing the culture, knowing the history, knowing the people, and coming up with that kind of win-win uh, attitude? You want my direct, complete, honest answer? I would expect nothing less. Sir. Yes, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Anybody who thinks to the contrary really needs to go back and re-examine the situation. Mm. I think in Afghanistan we had reason to go in. Sure. We were attacked by al-Qaeda, protected by the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys who went in did a brilliant job, mm -hmm. and then we dropped the ball. We forgot that you can, in fact, destroy a government, particularly a weak one like the Taliban, which made itself unpopular, but you have to then work with them to put in place something that has staying power, something that can demonstrate it's in the interests of its people, something that can begin to direct things farther forward in the future. And if you go in quickly and then run to a Iraq as the next domino uh, and get immersed in a place like Iraq uh, to the point where you can't get out almost, mm -hmm. then I think you made a serious mistake. And then there was this concept of occupying a country. No. That's not going to sit well with the people, is it? It'd sit well with us, would it? No. Are there lessons that we can learn yes. when we just, please? The military is not a shortcut for solving difficult foreign policy and di diplomatic issues. Mm. Until we appreciate the full extent of what's required to deal with a country militarily, including what happens after the combat phase, we haven't really made a judgment about what we are doing on the basis of the full cost to the United States in mm. many ways, mm. not just in blood and in treasure, but in prestige and in values. And that's very significant. That's why, in effect, the notion that wars of choice, bing, bang, all over the world can solve all of our problems is horrendously misplaced. Mm -hmm. We must defend ourselves. We have to be second to none. Mm -hmm. That kind of a posture in economic and military terms can support our diplomacy. I'd much rather be negotiating for the United States under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But think, Dennis, what's happened? Ten years in Iraq with what has to be seen as a very mixed result, a propensity toward continued civil conflict in Iraq between the religious groupings and the Kurds. Mm -hmm. If American military is all that good and all that powerful and all that dangerous, why didn't we win in two, three minutes <laughs> and have a, a rebuilding phase that went ahead simply splendidly and everything worked out? In effect, what we have done is we have undermined the credibility of our military ah. by trying to use mm -hmm. it to substitute for the harder work that's required in putting together the kind of solutions that I think will have enduring quality. And Maliki and, uh, and, and, and uh, Karzai are not the most... Uh, 
welcoming to the United States, no, aren't they? I mean, no, I had dinner with Karzai the other day, and I mean, Karzai can, particularly in public, beat up on us. It's mm -hmm. what he sees as like Mr. Putin, yeah. the basis for his domestic popularity. If he wants to get reelected, he's supposed to be reelected the next time. Mm -hmm. That's another issue we haven't talked to him about. Uh, but Maliki, too. Uh, on the other hand, we are not very good at changing governments, and mm -hmm. we're not very good at choosing for people mm -hmm. the folks who ought to run their show. So we ought to be very careful in believing that changing governments is a sovereign answer. And we're moving closer to that, unfortunately, in Iran. Mm. There are people in this country, some powerful people, some really interested people, who believe the only answer for Iran is to go in and change the government. When you say, who are you prepared to put in? They don't have a clue. No. I mean, it could be a Maliki, it could be a Karzai, it could be a Stalin. I don't know who, the, who they're going to put in. But the American people yeah. could not absorb yet another war. Oh, no. I, I don't mean, we think just... that we're... Uh, I think that the, this particular mode of activity for the last 10 years has proved that it is highly costly, mm -hmm. that it isn't delivering the sort of results that people expected. Mm -hmm. But we were sort of mesmerized. Maybe we were mesmerized by the success in Grenada maybe the success in Panama, whatever that was, that we could use the military force, take people out, uh, substitute others, uh, have everything move ahead, like the Hollywood movie, walking hand in hand into the sunset, mm -hmm. and everything would be okay. What is it? It's simplistic. You would just uh, and, ask... And the, your original question, the root cause of this, much of it was that we don't understand or are not plugged enough plugged in enough to the culture. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, I had friends in the State Department, I had graduated by then, I'd retired, uh, who prepared a, a long and I think very uh, introspective, very respectable appreciation of Iraq and the situation and what to do about it and how to handle it culturally and what to look at in the future. And, uh, and my friend Donald Rumsfeld apparently dismissed it according to reports totally out of hand. So get that oh. stuff out of here, that's just a diversion. Uh, we know what we're doing. We can handle it. Well, we course. didn't know what we, we were did, doing. We did not, unfortunately. I think, did it's, not. I think it's, it's too bad because I think that I spent my life, a lot of it overseas, and I understand the complexities of foreign culture. I remember a roundtable I did with foreign journalists, and I said, what do the people back home think, you know? And uh, they said, we don't like Americans coming in and telling us what to do. Sure. That was one thing they said. And the other thing is they were a little afraid or a, a lot afraid about having their own culture swallowed up by sure. the American Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. And those were two p points. That, that was my first remark to you tonight, yeah. as yeah. you know. Yeah. But the, the other is, is important. On the other hand, it is fascinating the degree to which American popular culture yes. is widely and enthusiastically still adopted. Yeah. By. And, and there is something to there. Yes. It's not just because it's American. Yeah. There's something that we it's is there's something that we do in our music. There's something we do in our cinema uh -huh. that has put us in, in that competitive position up at the top. Uh, Lord, let's hope we stay there. But in many ways, it's a very interesting contrast. Just as in the Middle East, people we tell you, you have two to three percent popularity in places like Jordan, where I used to be ambassador. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Terrible. On the other hand, the Jordanians and everybody will come to us and say, you're the only people who can help us with the Israelis. You're the only one with any <laughs> potential influence there. Right. You know, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you in, more engaged? If you mentioned uh, Israel, uh, you mentioned Jordan, you were ambassador in both of those I places. I was, yes. I was the first member of what I like to call the Schizophrenics Club. <laughs> Would you elaborate on this? Well, I mean, if you spent both side, time on both sides of the Jordan River or both <laughs> sides of the Arab-Israeli divide, then you know and understand the complexities of what you have to deal with. And uh, they're hard. A and schizophrenia uh, operates in different ways in different people, but uh -huh. it is basically trying to find or reconcile some of the most impossible circumstances in, in life. If uh, sometimes you hear uh, uh, Bill Clinton's name dropped <laughs> into that equation, sure. do you think he would be a good uh, person to yes. try to bring those sides I've, together? I've said so and written that I think he's the only one that I know of. Isn't that interesting? In the, the only American, one. in the American panoply, who has the innate capacity, the knowledge, the ability to deal with foreigners, 
uh, the way and understanding of this difficult problem. He got very close mm -hmm. at the end of his yeah. administration. Unfortunately, yeah. it was too rushed. Unfortunately, he didn't yeah. have enough preparatory time. Unfortunately, he had a he had a deadline. He was a lame duck. Yeah. But uh, in many ways, with the full support of President Obama, uh -huh. somebody like that, in my view, somebody like that, there was only one Bill Clinton. You were just asked by uh, President Obama uh, to work with Admiral uh, Mullen to uh, take a look at... Actually, it was Secretary Clinton. Se it was her responsibility under the law. Uh -huh. And she asked us, to, uh, to five of us, but okay. uh, uh, Admiral Mullen was very much a part of that. And very to take much a look a at real Benghazi. Part. We looked at Benghazi. We looked at, uh, and we looked at the television and we saw uh, Ambassador, uh, with uh, Secretary Clinton making an a, a mm -hmm. impassioned uh, brief. Uh, wh what do you make of uh, the lessons to be learned about Benghazi? Well, I have promised the State Department, since the report is theirs, mm -hmm. that they will be in charge of when and how I can speak about it. Okay. But I can certainly tell you yes. that the unclassified elements of the report, which is the bulk of the report, you have mm -hmm. it all there, mm -hmm. speak for themselves. They make it very clear there were some 29 critical lessons that we saw, and our group, there were five of us, uh, were unanimous in making our findings. It was tough very mm -hmm. hard. Mm -hmm. But we thought that there were systemic difficulties. There were difficulties in the way personnel was assigned. There were difficulties in the way people responded to requests for improvement. There were difficulties in the way people related such issues as fire and security, fire danger and security and all those things. Mm -hmm. They're all there in that, that uh, unclassified report. And in my view, we told it like it was. Secretary Clinton was in many ways courageous enough and clearly supportive enough to say at her hearings, mm -hmm. for which I admire her, we asked this group to give it to us straight from the shoulder, and we did. And it was not, it was not pleasant. It was not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people that I have known for a long period of time that I think I had to make critical judgments about, and that's very hard. I always wonder how to phrase this question, and I still haven't found out the way to phrase it. But thinking about Benghazi, uh, and God bless the people who were uh, killed, you know, the Americans who were killed. I look at uh, Algeria, and a number of Americans were killed there. Does Benghazi take on a whole different uh, story because an ambassador was killed? In many ways, yes, and in many ways, no. Chris Stevens worked for me for two years. Mm. I knew him well, highly mm -hmm. admired him. Mm -hmm. I thought he was the, one of the very best of his new generation. Mm. And he performed, I think, extremely well under very difficult circumstances. But every American who was involved, mm. who gave their lives, did so out of a commitment to our country, out of a sense of self-sacrifice, out of patriotism. And none of them in any way at all in that sense was any less committed or any less important to us. Good. Mm -hmm. And I think we ought to look at that. But the fact is that we lost an ambassador, the first since 1988, mm -hmm. uh, meant that the public attention was turned to it. Mm -hmm. I was very disturbed that, in fact, this became part of the electoral political football that played a role mm -hmm. or tried to play a role in the elections. And that, too, magnified it, I think, out of all proportion. And our ah. report attempted uh, to tell the American people exactly what happened insofar as we could know it uh, on the evening and in the lead up uh, to the time when four brave Americans were killed in the line of duty for their country mm. uh, and to do as best we could to do that on the basis of over a hundred personal interviews which we had with individuals some actually engaged at the front line and in the events and many f in a position to know very important things about it. We had uh, hours of video to review. We had uh, thousands of pages of documents. I personally tried to read the State Department's uh, regular production of every daily press article they could find. Wow. Because mm -hmm. I knew that people asking questions should be listened to. I didn't think in the whole that many of the issues people raised seemingly out of the top, the top of their heads, and apparently in some cases for political purposes were germane or relevant, but I wanted to know what they were, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know that in our study, in our review, 
we had taken into account everything that we could see and hear. Otherwise, we would not have credibility. Otherwise, we would not be reporting uh, to the State Department as honestly and as straightforward and as succinctly as we could. Mm. Ambassador, we are at the end of our time. It is absolutely amazing that we are. And rather than try to put some kind of a fancy button at the end of this program, could I invite you to come back Dennis, again? Dennis, I would love to. Uh, I enjoy talking, although I was going to tell you I got paid as a diplomat the same amount for listening as talking, and I tried to do two-thirds of the listening and one-third of the talking. I will fail your program. <laughs> but will I would you like come, to come back. Will course. you come back again? It would be a delight. And so we'll just say to be continued. Absolutely. Ambassador. Thank you, sir. Good to be with good you. Good to be with you. Thank sir. you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Very much. Good. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, an online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the National Education Association the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsong Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. The U.S.-China Education Trust and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings.